Well, good morning. How is the volume of this? Is it good? Is it a, can you hear okay? Good. Hard to tell from here. Impossible to tell from here. Well, hi, I am Robert. Who's here for the first time? Please, one, two, three. Brave souls out on a Sunday morning <clears throat> on a quest, as we all are, really. What I think I'm going to talk about this morning in the Dharma talk is why one meditates. With asking you the question, why do you? I've been asked, not so much, well, I've been asking myself that question having been uh, sort of ill. I've had quite a lot of uh, asthma for the last few weeks and uncharacteristic, unusual. And uh, it's been kind of challenging. I'm so glad I had the Dharma to be able to sit and just go quiet and watch the symptoms. But um, meditation didn't make it go away. And even after all these years, I have a certain longing. Well, if I, you know, if I just sit for an hour or two, or maybe three, <laughs> then shouldn't I be well? And it doesn't seem to work like that, does it? It didn't make it more bearable. So, uh, I invite you to, if you wish, stay interior and quiet, or turn to your neighbor and speak to them about you. One thing you're really glad about yourself, one thing you really like about yourself, or one thing you're really glad you did in your life. So we'll just take two or three minutes just to kind of break the ice and connect. It's just an old piece of Burmese brass. Is this working? Yeah, it is. Okay. That's a Burmese temple gong. All we, that's the shape of the gong. It's shaped like a, a Buddhist burial mound. And um, you hit the wings and it flaps sort of like this. And, and uh, the mythology of it is that it calls all beings to practice. 
So the little dog across the street, <laughs> the little irritating little dog across the street <laughs> that lives on the second floor at the window <laughs> and barks a lot all week, which I have no resentment of at all, <laughs> of which I'm conscious. <laughs> But it, it calls all of us humans and the, the creatures from the heaven realms and the dog realms and the hell realms to practice. So these are the refuges in the Buddha Dharma Sangha. In what can we possibly take refuge? We can't take refuge in planetary weather stability or in health, or in youth, or in relationship, or in babies, or in what? Well, there is this mysterious, utterly mysterious capacity that we have of being awake and aware, which is the Buddha. So that's one place. And then the Dharma, what we discover when we're awake is the way things are. And the way things are is constantly changing. And when we look really carefully, we'll never find a self in them. What we find is the universe. And then refuge in the Sangha. It's us, this community of practice. It's also the refuge in the community of those who've gone before us and really learned how to love to be awake and I like to add in the community of all life there's a lot of us here on the earth right now billions of humans countless billions of other creatures and we all flash into being from who knows where and then we disappear that's our family right kind of makes kind of makes hating each other a little absurd. So I invite you to join me in this modern rendition of the refuge chants. Go like this. <clears throat> I take refuge in the Buddha, the one who shows me the way in this life. Namo Buddhaya, Namo Buddhaya, Namo Buddhaya. I take refuge in the Dharma, the way of understanding and love. Namo Dharmaya, Namo Dharmaya, Namo Dharmaya. I take refuge in the Sangha, the community of
So, we pause. <clears throat> we pause in the headlong rush somewhere between our birth and our death. Right here in this moment where for a little while we can abandon the notion that more stimulation is going to finally fill our cup. A few more sights, sounds, smells, tastes, touches, thoughts, ideas, surely something there will do it. But interestingly and gratefully for everyone in this room, a new notion has dawned, which is that perhaps happiness lies somewhere else. Perhaps it lies in us. Perhaps it is our true nature. Not the happiness of some mood or some flavor, but the simple happiness of being and being with whatever is. One truth of our human beingness is the fact that there is a body. It's pretty dense, it's moderately compact energy which has taken on a particular form for a little while. And the miracle of awareness can inhabit it, can know it, can embrace it, can be intimate with the fact of a body sitting here and touching the cushion or the floor. It can know the contact of clothing with the body. It can know temperature, the fire element. Please notice where the warm areas of your body are and the cool areas.
And I want to welcome those of you that are joining us over the internet from such great distances. And also over time, for those of you that will view this later, in that present moment. And the moment is always now, because now is what exists. And of course, since we are alive in this moment, there is the fact of breathing. There's breathing in, and then there's breathing out. And the more attention we bring to this breathing, the more interesting it becomes. And we can start to notice there's usually a pause between each breath. bloodstream becomes sufficiently saturated with oxygen and there's no need to breathe. And then the carbon dioxide from the metabolism of sugars builds up and then there's the need to breathe and then it breathes itself. It breathes in to fullness and then out again till it's complete. It's really a great relief to discover that it's okay to really rest or relax. <coughs> the world doesn't come to a screeching halt or fall apart 
Nothing bad happens if we allow ourselves to just sit and breathe. Of course, it does reveal how much the mind likes to control things and to wander and to worry and to plan. And so all of that becomes more visible, more known. When you can, abide in in-breathing and out-breathing. <coughs> when this is impossible because of the various activities of the mind, Then we turn awareness to those activities of mind and see what they are. They are part of nature, just like weather. Even when they're really painful or excruciating, frustrating, They're just what the human mind does. And the refuge in Dharma means to really notice what's real. Real and temporary and fleeting. And to come back when you can to the actual sensations of breathing in and breathing
do you discover as you sit quietly? Is the mind just open and spacious and resting easily in the sensations of breathing with occasional thoughts like fluffy clouds on a summer day? Or is there some tumult Thunderstorms, earthquakes, worries, desires, plans, remorse, anxiety, sadness, fear, joy, delight. Whatever's happening, it's worthy of our heartfelt, loving, compassionate attention. Is there a certain evaluation and then criticism? I'm not doing this very well, or I should be different. I'm wasting my time. That too is particularly worthy of awareness. That's the grasping, aversive, separate self-mind with its almost endless self-improvement programs. This moment is like this. And no matter what the inner weather is presenting, <coughs> beneath it or before it, there's this living, sensitive, feeling body, this heart beating, this breath breathing. miraculously complex body that exists in the present moment. Now. Now. Just right now, here.
This moment is like this, exactly as it is. In a few moments, I'm going to propose that we plan the ending of this time of sitting in silence together. We could do it with a gong, a gong that symbolizes the process. Or we could do it from within with the intention to notice the, in this case, prompted by this voice, intention to sometime in the next minute or so see how it is that you allow or activate opening the eyelids. How does that happen? It requires intention. And then to operationalize that and then notice how difficult it is or how much effort there is in slowly opening the eyelids. And becoming aware of what happens when you do this, which is that visual objects leap into being. They're not there and then they do exist again. We could call it seeing consciousness. This is different from saying I'm seeing, which is a whole other level of complexity. Seeing. Seeing. We could also be aware of hearing. it's really true that what we are is a node of consciousness? What if we thought of the brain as a tuning device that allowed sensitivity at the eyes, the nose, the ear, the feeling body? What if all those stories of I, me, and mine are actually kind of magical displays in consciousness? And now giving the intention or the willingness to let the body move a bit, to move and be really aware of this movement. How does it happen? track <coughs> and I bet you lose track too sometimes of the importance of what we're doing here <coughs> the importance for our own sanity and therefore 
remember the importance of our capacity to be kind with our loved ones and families, to be responsible in the world. It's a big thing. And interestingly, it comes down to the actions of the individual, though supported by community. That's the refuge in Sangha. It's so important that we have each other. So in that regard, I want to invite you to participate as fully as you want, as fully as you're drawn in the community. And to Avi will speak about some of the other practice opportunities. There's also the opportunity available to practice generosity and support PIMC financially. You can do it online, you can do it at the back of the room. Um, but to think about the importance of this building and this organization in your life. And to vote as we do vote all the time with our pocketbooks to support the center. The best way for the center is a monthly contribution that comes out. that transfers, and to think of it as a spiritual act, as an important spiritual act. Another is to volunteer, if you, there's lots of volunteer work that needs to be done. We speak of this karma yoga opportunities, and particularly on the volunteer, on the work days, the volunteer days, uh, to get to know each other, that's really fun. And uh, there's a, a special request that I have this Sunday, which is that, <coughs> Last Sunday, at 2 o'clock in the morning, an apparently mentally ill person used a Sharpie on the front doors. You may have noticed them this morning. They're painted over with some really, to my, to my observation, pretty crazy stuff. And it was when Avi went out to check something, to, check, to get the mail at 2 o'clock on Sunday afternoon that we discovered it. And it meant that everyone that had come into the building that morning had passed it. And I talked to several people and they said, well, yeah, I saw that. And if something like that happens, please tell someone. Because this is your place. This isn't, there isn't an owner of PIMC. It's not mine. It's a nonprofit organization and it belongs to the people who participate. So it's yours. And if you came and found graffiti over your front door, you would want to say, hey, how are we going to deal with this? So who knows what the next <laughs> adventure will be. It's a strange thing living in this time. I think it's always been strange. But uh, I invite you to participate as fully as you are drawn to. And we're a little phobic of commitment and community here in our time. So it's sometimes pushing a little bit uphill. So, maybe that's what I wanted to say now. Uh, I figured out how to, I'm going to talk this morning about the five hindrances, but use them as the frame for this, for making sense of, of uh, practice, practice in difficult times, personally and globally and so on. So that'll happen at 10, or 11 rather. Between now and then, Jim's going to do some movement practice, and Avi will have some in invitations. <coughs> and there we go. So I offer it to you, Jim. The helm is yours. Stand here. <clears throat> Am I on? Is it right? Can you hear me? I can't hear anything. So no. I can't hear anything. Right. No. It's 
It's not very loud. Testing, testing. Are we here? Okay. Now I hear it. What was that? Oh, oh who was that masked man? <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's what I usually hear, is that little echo from the back wall. All right. So, here, <clears throat> watch what happens when you say to yourself, I am standing here. Or, we are standing here. Or, standing is happening here, now. Just play with that a little bit. I am standing here. We are standing here. Standing. Here. Now. I am listening. Listening. Here. Now. And then letting listening reach out as far as you can towards your left. What is the farthest sound you are aware of? What is the farthest sound to your right? Listening in this huge soundscape. Standing, listening, sinking, Rising up, pressing out to the side, making two balanced circles with the arms, but still listening, still in touch with the floor. Is awareness limited to one dimension? Or are we little flowers blooming in this garden of PIMC with our petals open to the sky in all directions. Not just towards the sun, but towards the sky. Bringing our hands together, feeling the palms touching, rising up, pressing forward, but listening, standing, Feeling the palms, feeling the shoulders. Feeling a part of this garden and feeling a unique movement here now in these shoulders and hands and knees. and then stepping towards the trees in the yard with one foot and <clears throat> extending that same arm and looking towards the center of the room and then backing off and lifting the toe for the leg that's towards the trees. I can't say all these things that are happening. <laughs> so this is called the wind in the willow. So just let these arms move like a wind in the willows. And then come back to the center and step towards the street, extending that leg and that arm and looking towards the center of the room, straightening your head and looking towards the center of the room as you reach, letting the wind move through the willows. Isn't awareness amazing? Awareness of feet, hands, temperature, movement of the air against the skin, or the skin against the air, depending upon how you want to think about it. Back to the center. 
balancing on the leg towards the trees, taking the energy that's just sort of radiating from your torso down the other leg, releasing it out into the world, then balancing on the street side, taking the energy down the other leg. So the other, the, the other leg in every case is soft. And then there's one leg that's balancing us and holding us up. Awareness of firmness, awareness of flow. At the same time, how does that work? Listening. Coming back to the center. Standing here and now. <coughs> Pressing towards the trees. Pressing towards the street. Feeling the weight shift. One leg firm, the other resting. <laughs> and I have no idea how to explain the next one. <laughs> Do this opposite of me. <laughs> I didn't hear you. <laughs> I've never done this before in my life. I've taught this many times, but never with you and never now. All right, let's rest for a second here. What's the next step? Uh, streets, uh, tree side balance, extend the other heel down. Feel that balance. This, the, the first thing we did was um, the spirit shows the way. And now the stubborn child says, no way. <laughs> Again, feel the flow on one side and the firmness on the other. And the, and the awareness switches back and forth effortlessly. It's not, it's not clinging to anything. Awareness just is. It's something like a personality that clings. All right, here we go again. Both hands up, step back, go towards the trees. <clears throat> Come back to the center, both hands up, step back towards the street. This is the uh, crane bowing to the moon. I'm glad it's not 94 degrees. Mm -hmm. All right, back to the center. <coughs> Does anyone know what a windlass is? It's sort of that round thing that you turn to make the uh, sails on the Say, uh, yeah, the sailing vessel, whatever you want to trying to say. A sailboat, yeah, there we go. So soft hands, soft wrists, soft shoulders, but sinking, breathing in, reaching but not clinging, like you're turning a windlass. How many sensations are there? What is awareness doing? It's aware of contact with the floor, of listening, of seeing, releasing, moving against gravity, but all of that's happening simultaneously in awareness. My mouth has to go step by step by step. But awareness doesn't function that way. It flows. And then we open to the side. Again, making circles. You might 
not remember, but one hand that was going clockwise before is now going counterclockwise. So we balanced our two movements. The opening movement and the closing are mirror images, sort of. And the body likes that. So come to rest, standing. The body's stimulated. The mind has been stimulated. There's been a harmony in this garden among all the flowers. And this garden exists in this soundscape that goes off hundreds of feet, thousands of feet perhaps. But then there's a being scape, not a soundscape or a landscape that we can see, but a being scape that has no end. How did we get here? And that was fun. Thank you. Good morning, Sangha. I have a few announcements. If you don't know me, my name is Avi, I'm community coordinator here. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the people that brought in the beautiful flowers that um, greeted you at the door to help you feel welcome that set up the kitchen for the, uh, for the hospitality afterwards. Could you raise your hands? Who, who are you? Where are you? Yes, raise them high. Raise them high. These are people who are hosting you, who are making this place comfortable for you. And uh, we appreciate their efforts. And if you feel called to help do that, then Kirsten, who's our volunteer coordinator, would be happy to talk with you about how we can plug you in to not only doing something that you would enjoy doing, that would take your practice off the cushion, but also allow you to get to know people here and get deeper into this community. Um, so a few other announcements. On Saturday, August 18th, we've got our Buddhist movie night at PIMC, the Dharma Brothers at 6.30 p.m. Mickey, are you around? She stepped out. All right, well, well, Mickey is the coordinator of that, and she'd be happy to answer questions. Um, also, on Saturday, August 18th, we've got another of Jim's half-day Qigong retreats uh, that will be um, similar to what we just did for about 10 minutes. And if you liked it for 10 minutes, I'd imagine you'd like it for four hours. So that, that is a once-month opportunity here at PIMC. Information is on the website. Um, on Sunday, August 19th, um, Patricia, who is a member of our uh, audiovisual team is going to be producing outros. Did you know that we have podcasts? You know what podcasts are, right? So we, we, have, we have our own podcast. You can now get your Dharma talks, listening to them in your car without having to watch them. And uh, Patricia, <laughs> Patricia gave me this thing that I can read, which is really, it's really nice. It, you, so you know we have a podcast. You can check it out on the website, um, portlandinsight.org slash podcast. And the podcast is a great way to carry the Dharma teachings with you, so you can listen to them anywhere. And at the end of each PIMC uh, podcast episode, somebody in the community reads a short outro. And we'd love to include each and every one of you reading in your natural voice just a couple of sentences in your natural way. It's sort of a similar format to Radio Lab, which any, if any of you have listened to Radio Lab on NPR, so it's totally cool. And you don't, we don't expect you to be professional. As a matter of fact, we want you to be just who you are. So um, after the Dharma talk on the 19th, Patricia is going to be on site here in that little room. She's going to record the outros. Each one will take maybe a minute in order to do. And there's no need to sign up. You'll just come to that small room. Just line up. And if you cannot be here to do it, she can also record you over the phone. 
so that you can do it anytime, so you don't even have to be here. So if you would like to be a part of the audio record of PIMC, please consider doing that. If you have more questions, you can ask me. Patricia, could you raise your hand? Patricia is right there. She'd be happy to talk with you about it. Um, for this month of August, there is no children's program. The children's program is on vacation and will start again in early September. Starting Wednesday, August 22nd, we've got another edition of our class, Skillful Speech, Nonviolent Communication, with Doyle and Kirsten. And Kirsten is right there. And uh, you can sign up on the website. On Saturday, August, uh, Saturday, September 1st, we have our first Saturday monthly day-long retreat at PIMC, which we always hold on the first Saturday of the month. There are more details coming on Sunday, September 2nd. We're doing our mindfulness uh, PIMC orientation session with Robert. On Sunday, September 9th, we will have yet again our second Sunday potluck, which we've got today. So feel free to bring your secret family recipes or Trader Joe's secret family recipes. <laughs> and we would appreciate that. On Wednesday, September 12th, during the evening, we have a, a new uh, nonviolent communication practice group with Doyle and Kirsten, second Wednesday of the month. It's limited to people who've studied, studied NVC. Please look on the website for details. Then we have two other classes that are starting up in September. September 20th starts Basics of Mindfulness with Doug Cullen. Um, that will be Thursday evenings from 6 to 7.30. There will be details on the website that on that this week. Then the other class will start Wednesday, September 26. That class will be the Eightfold Path class on Wednesday evenings. Details will be coming soon. Um, please join us after Robert's Dharma talk for hospitality. Even if you have brought nothing, bring yourself because that's as valuable as any food that you can bring and we would love to get to know you better. Um, in terms of Donna that, that uh, Robert mentioned, we also have our card reader there. So I know it is very strange to think of little squares of plastic that contain money, but that is the way our society works. Did you know that in ancient Rome, soldiers were paid with bags of salt? <laughs> so we use squares of plastic. So please apply your squares of plastic if you feel so inclined in the card reader there that is over there on the Donna table. Um, if you want to engage this community on a deeper level, consider volunteering. Kirsten would be happy to talk with you about that. Um, we have other sits during the week. This is the big one, but we have more intimate ones. You can find out information on the website about those smaller ones and find something maybe that is more intimate if that's what you would like. We also have spiritual friends groups that meet in people's homes on their own schedules to talk about the Dharma and to do practice together. There is information on the website. Uh, we also do, uh, we make Dharma consults available on request. If you have an issue that is coming up in your practice and you want to talk with a teacher about it here, or if you want a quick on-ramp to developing your own practice, a teacher is happy to spend 30 minutes with you talking about how to do that. And you can do that through uh, phone, Facebook, uh, Facebook, uh, the, the video conference or in person, and just call me and we can arrange for a teacher to see you. And then finally, for any questions that you have about the way this place works, or for a way to get in deeper in, in this community, I would be happy to help you with that. I'm here Mondays through Thursdays in the morning. Blessings to you all, have a wonderful day.
Well, I sure wish each of you could sit where I sit right now. In fact, in a certain way, you do want to take, let's take a moment to just look around the room, viewer seeing, and just notice who you see. Maybe you're seeing yourself in your many forms. <clears throat> well, all talk is downhill after that, isn't it? <laughs> Let's move into the realm of abstract concepts and Sneeze coming, maybe. <laughs> it's a, it's a, uh, it's maybe a preemptive <laughs> nose touch. So I just decided here at the last second, I want to read you what I think of as the founding document of PIMC. I've uh, read this, oh, here's some sneeze. <sighs> the body goes, comes first, doesn't it? It has its primacy. It's from that great saint of the 20th century, Mr. Rogers. I saw, the, how many of you saw the movie in the theaters? Quite a few. Wasn't that something? A movie, a movie you walk out of feeling good. So this is, this is the foundational document. A friend of mine visited a beautiful monastery where a dozen monks, most of whom were in their 70s and 80s, were living. This is a place where once 60 to 70 men spent their lives studying and following a rule of very strict living, praying together seven times a day, seven days a week. They worked hard and were successful. My friend asked one of the monks why he felt that over the years the community had dwindled from 60 to 12. His reply was, we did everything right. And somewhere in all that successful praying and work and living, we lost the most important thing of all. The thing that was so contagious and attracted people to us, we lost the naked love. Little by little, the success replaced the love. Oh, sure. You can have love and success, but the love has to remain first, always first. Natural, affirming, inclusive, naked love. Love and success, always in that order. It's that simple and it's that difficult. Isn't that true? It's true in our relationships, it's true with everything that really matters. And then this I wanted to read. Again, Mr. Rogers. I know how important it is to give up our, expectation, our expectations of perfection in any arena of our lives. I know I've hard, tried hard to do this, and yet I know that every once in a while, the old pattern emerges. Maybe if I could make at least one proper segment of the program. And then I find myself in that trap again. That doesn't mean we can't produce highly satisfying moments for ourselves and others, but it is important to give up, maybe daily, trying to be perfect. Of course, I think we want it so strongly because we reason that if we are perfect, if we do a perfect job, we will be perfectly lovable. What a heavy burden that is. Thank God we don't have to earn every little bit of love that comes our way. He made 1,794 editions of Mr. Rogers. It's a lot. Very intentionally. I didn't know about the quality of his intention that he saw children as people, <laughs> and he said that they have real feelings and real thoughts, and they need to be met there. And one of the things they showed in the movie was when um, 
Bobby Kennedy was assassinated, uh, he broke all the rules. And he, they did a week on death for children. And uh, uh, they talked about assassin. What does assassination mean? And so they gave the children contact around that. It was quite something. So, kind of beautiful guiding principle for me. <clears throat> and I thought of the perfection thing this morning because I, uh, I uh, wanted to sing this song and I can't do it perfectly. So I've covered my bass now, you know, that <laughs> you can't, can't say I didn't warn you. But I also haven't been using my guitar and teaching for about a couple of months because I've been sick. And I can't reach the bass notes and a lot of things I want to speak about. But and um, it's so important to give up trying to be perfect. I want to share this song with you. I've shared it here a couple of times before. It's a Mary Goche song. This is bugging me. So I invite you to listen with your heart. Cloud. 
people in power they'll do anything to keep their crown I love life and life itself could use some mercy now yeah we all could use a little mercy now. I know we don't deserve it, but we need it anyhow. We hang in the balance, dangle between hell and hallowed ground. some mercy now every single one of us could use some mercy now every single one of us could use some mercy now came upon a really interesting, helpful article. Not sure why it was helpful. Maybe the truth is helpful. <laughs> By a person who's been in environmental climate change research <clears throat> for decades and decades. And she said that for her, this summer will be the, is the moment when what she'd been thinking would come in her lifetime arrived. That the instability and the changes that are coming are here. And they're not just here in Bangladesh or Pakistan or places where other people live, they're actually here. And I've been feeling that myself. I've been sensitized to the issue for a long time. I actually did a master's in environmental studies and I uh, completed it in 1974 at York University. I had traveled for five years before that all over the planet. And uh, I was so appalled by what was happening. The, the degradation, the environmental degradation uh, then was stunning. And of course, it's only grown. So, I've been being affected by what seems to be happening, which is happening. And I got uh, thrown into that, the sickness that I've had. I got a cold when I was in Canada. I think I mentioned this. I was in Canada and I got my cold and they always go to my lungs and this time I went to my lungs and then it turned into asthma, which I haven't had much of in my life. but. Uh, I think, with the help of some heavy-duty <laughs> acupuncture and Western medicine, I think the corner has turned and I'm feeling much better the last few days, which is really good. But, what a relief. But what I discovered that I think was what I wanted to talk about was the way that the low energy and depression and inability to function highly, um, what an effect it had. 
And this is a pretty mild illness, really. You know, treatable, likely to go away or go back into remission. But there, I know there are folks in this room who are working with uh, much more serious life-threatening issues. And so the question then arose for me, how is my meditation helping me? How, how is 40 years of Dharma practice and all of these years of psychotherapy, how is it helping me cope with this circumstance of an illness? And uh, so as I reflected on that, one thing that is pretty much a given for me and uh, at other times of the day, but when I get up in the morning, I spend almost every day at least an hour, sometimes an hour and a half, just sitting. And in that sitting, the suffering diminishes. There may, the symptoms may stay exactly the same, but the resistance to them goes down and down and down until there's quite a bit of ease. And that's really important. And I know one of the things that I harp on is please develop a daily practice. Do, the, do whatever it takes to take to make time and to start small. Start with a minute or five minutes or... Um, but t t t to, to get our practice to a place where we can simply pause and be in that capacity of observing whatever's happening, no matter how painful it is, and to stop suffering, to reduce suffering, which is, of course, the core. The first thing the Buddha taught, that, that applique, that the, the sewing thing back on the wall there, <coughs> I purchased in Bangkok. Uh, it's the, Buddha, the Buddha's first teaching. And he's got his, he's, I think he's got his first, I think he's got his First finger, and the first, the first ennobling truth is there's suffering. And what I'm discovering as I age, and maybe as I, as my eyes open, there is so much suffering on the planet. I mean, the the magnitude of it, the ubiquitous nature of it, is so stunning. So that's the first noble truth, and then the second is what's the cause of the suffering? Not what's the cause of the pain and breakdown of things, but the, the, the suffering element lies in the human mind, in the fact that it's very difficult to accept things as they are. It's very difficult to accept how unstable everything is. It's very difficult to, ex to accept how out of control everything is. Um, it's very difficult to accept that the self I mean, th this idea even seems crazy sometimes, that this experience of self is just one little tuning of the possibilities and that there are other, there are other tunings. There's the tuning where we're everything, and of course everything's falling apart because we came into being for a few moments. That's our, our lot, is to come into being and we get to do a few dances, and then f we leave the dance. <coughs> so there's suffering, there's a cause, and then there's the end. There's the great sweet relief of that, release of that, which arises through consciousness, which arises through remembering what we really are, which the teachings all loop back, which is the refuge in the Buddha Dharma Sangha, which is the refuge in being in that which is awake. I'm not sure why this is popping up in my mind. I, I spent some time yesterday with a dear friend. <coughs> some of you know him, Larry Thornton Jones. He's a, there's a great video, mostly of him, of the two of us here, but uh, on YouTube, on uh, developmental psychology, the form, how it is that the self forms, which then we use spiritual practice to realize how, how it dissolves. So I recommend that on YouTube about two, three years ago. But we were sitting over in the park and <coughs> I, was, I was looking at the baseball diamond, which was below us. 
And of course I didn't see them, but I've been there when there have been people playing baseball. And in this imagination came the people playing baseball that I watched 30 years ago in that park, and then came their children playing baseball, and this whole thing of generations of people playing baseball on that field. People coming and cheering their child on, and then, uh, then they passed away, then they disappeared. I mean, it's been a baseball diamond for, I don't know, 60 years or so. And that there's something about that, that this coming into being and then disappearing business, which is the essence of the Buddha's teachings on impermanence, that, uh, I don't know, it's kind of, it's really got my attention attention. <coughs> so, what is it that keeps us from inhabiting a space of consciousness in which we realize everything's impermanent and the whole field of being is love and compassion? What is it that keeps us or more precisely for me, what is it that keeps me clenched? And um, the Buddha's answer to that was a wrong view, a wrong, it's, it's a mistake that happens in consciousness that when a sound happens, or this voice, or a thought happens, instead of it just happening, there's something that gets added and it's I, me, mine, I, me, mine, my thought, my sound, my hearing, my liking, my disliking. And so the entire thrust of the deeper spiritual training in mindfulness is about encountering that habit of making an I, a me, and a mine out of experience. This is a little side trip, but I wanted to mention it. There's a, a great, mindfulness is sweeping the Western world. It's, it's sweeping America for sure. Hospitals, there's mindfulness-based stress reduction, there's mindfulness-based applications for psycho psychology. There's mi mindfulness is coming into the schools a lot. All kinds of experimental programs and, and it will radically change lives. And there's another level, which is what we're addressing here, in addition to those first two, which is where mindfulness addresses the question, who am I? Who am I? How shall I live? How will I die? And how will I participate in the community of my time? And I'm adding for myself, particularly given the magnitude of the challenges that are because we have not only our personal challenges, and there's plenty of them, <laughs> um, but we have these social and political and climatological challenges, which are pretty big. So how shall we stay human? How, how shall we become more and more loving and compassionate as our own issues grow and become more difficult as we age, or, or as life th throws us the bowling ball. Uh, and then how can we live in such a way that we have the extra energy required to take our place in the evolutionary movement of consciousness that is necessary for, for our culture, for the world? <coughs> and I think it, belong, it, it begins in our own practice. It begins right here. And it begins in really devoting the time and energy necessary to develop a compassionate heart, starting with ourselves. And that's quite an undertaking. Right? And I can grimace because I think that while there's a lot of people doing that, there's a lot that aren't. 
But fortunately, the only person that we're responsible for is this one. And so we can make the changes, we can, we can do the work that is necessary to transform our own hearts. So I want to talk about it <coughs> through the lens of the five hindrances. Because the, the five hindrances are, they're the inner weather of the self. And it's such a relief to see weather as weather, not as me or mine. <coughs> so the five hindrances are, how many of you could name the five hindrances? Raise your hand, please. <laughs> okay, it's the right day for a talk on the five hindrances. And just so you know, the five hindrances will be on the exam. <laughs> You'll have to name them and give one example of each <laughs> in order to get out of here. <laughs> that points out a, uh, an interesting truth to me too, that I've been talking about the five hindrances for 35 years and I forget that not everyone's heard about them <laughs> 400 times. So here they are. <clears throat> I'm sitting here in complete and utter communion with the universe. I am, I am God. I am one. I am the one. And I see all of you as the same. And then something happens. Something that's very mammalian, very normal, that we wouldn't be here without. And that is that desire arises. Oh, I'd, I'd like some of that. <laughs> I'd like a double helping of that, please. I'd like, in fact, I'd like a week of that, please. And what could that be? It could be anything, right? Any desire. I want, I want. And in that moment of I want, or it wants, shoo, I forget. I forget that I'm everything. I forget that I'm one intrusive thought keeps coming in from my Catholic childhood. Some of you will remember the scene, pretty important scene in the Christian mythology. <coughs> Jesus, who's been abiding in the great oneness for some time, or at least visiting it frequently, is on the cross, nails. Those Romans, the Romans really knew how to put down an insurgency. <laughs> they nailed people to crosses and put them up along the roads, and they left them there. Not so nice. Um, Anyway, there he is on the cross, and he shrinks down into this little separate self, and he says, Father, why hast thou forsaken me? Why now? Right? Why now do I shrink down and, and forget what I really am, and now I'm this little frightened creature? And then the next moment, uh, Father, into, unto thy hands I commend myself. It's like, I give up. I, I'll go back. I'll surrender. So, among the ways that we contract, central are greed, desire, wanting. I want, I want. We can come to our meditation, and our meditation can be just one big long desire. I, I'm sitting here, and I'm thirsty, or I'm hot, and I'm kind of depressed, and oh, there's this anxiety happening, and there's all these things happening. I, I want, oh, I want that bliss. I was on a retreat two weeks ago, and I had this moment of bliss, and I, that's what I want. Yes, oh, can I have that? I want that, please. And, uh, um, and so I don't, I don't pause and realize, huh, I, what, I, what I've become is a person who wants. All I, all I want is wanting. Now, wanting is very supported in modernity. And uh, as Joseph Goldstein, wonderful modern teacher, said some years ago, 
we're so accustomed to desire being portrayed as a positive thing that we actually look online, we look at catalogs, we, we window shop, we, and we experience that, that, as, that wanting as a pleasant experience. And that's one of the reasons for that is uh, because we can sometimes get it. And then in that moment of getting, there's this tremendous release of the, of the pain of desire. Now, if we didn't have the capacity for getting it sometimes, it wouldn't be so fun. Desire, desire when what, what, what we're desiring is food for our children and we're waiting on the truck from the UN to show up in our village isn't much fun. It's desire. So, first hindrance, desire. The second one, <coughs> that's this, right? I want. The second one is I don't want. I don't want this symptom. I don't want my child to be this way. I don't want my wife to have passed away. I don't want the present political circumstances. I don't want, I don't want. And so the mind is filled with I don't want, I don't want, I don't want. So in desire there's wanting, in aversion there's pushing against. And aversion goes all the way to hatred and begins with the subtle there's an itch, I don't like it. I don't like it. I don't like it. So that's the first two of the great hindrances, the great causes of suffering. <coughs> and again, with aversion, here I am, I am one, I am one with the infinite sun. But I don't like this. The third great hindrance is restlessness, agitation, worry, and remorse. And in that, the mind is going jump, 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 jump. Now worry, worry serves a function. We survived as a species because we, we learned we're a vulnerable species. I mean, no armor, soft belly, no claws, teeth, hardly useful at all. <laughs> but here we are, the dom we're so dominant we may be wiping ourselves out, as well as a lot of other of our brothers and sisters, friends. So we develop this mind which can create fantasies, it creates abstraction, and therefore we can create a fantasy of a future, and then we can save food, we can build tools, we can build dams, we can do medical research, we can do all this stuff because we can fantasize the future. The problem with it is that we, didn't, we don't know where the switch is. And we're, we can then always worry. And we can always create fantasies of something bad happening uh, so that this present moment is always, we're always a flutter. Either that or we can remember back into the past. We can create fantasies of a past and have remorse, oh, I shouldn't have done that. If I hadn't said that, then this would be. So once again, I fall from grace, I fall from my oneness with everything into, oh, what about the future? What about the past? And these have direct connections, of course, <coughs> to the central nervous system, to the biochemistry, and they can fire me up into hyper alertness, and then I can't sleep, and then I'm worried, and then I can hardly be with the person I'm with, and I can't be very functional because I'm lost in worry. So that's the mind way energized. And then there's sloth and torpor dullness, which looks in meditation like this. You'll recognize it. I have three times in my teaching career fallen completely off my seat <laughs> in, in teaching. <laughs> and uh, I now use my iPad a lot, but I <coughs> when, I, when I have my computer, I'm always very careful to angle the screen away because the number of times I have lunged forward into my screen <laughs> and it would be bad to get a Makes me, would be a good one. Remember that 
there was a great TV series. Um, it always started with a death. What was it called? Six Feet Under. Six feet under. Yeah. Actually, I was in the midst of, this is an aside, I was in the midst of watching that series when uh, some time ago, I was a long time ago, not 10 years, I was uh, with my partner and I bought her a, uh, I bought her a tree. She wanted a dogwood tree outside the kitchen window. So I got her a fairly large one with a heavy root ball. <laughs> it was in the wheelbarrow and she was pulling with a rope to get up the hill and I was pushing the wheelbarrow and I was going and my feet slipped out from me and I hit the wheelbarrow, bam, the edge of the barrel, and I fell to the ground and this <laughs> my first check was, hmm, am I okay? Yes, and then I started roaring with laughter. This would, this would be a perfect six foot under <laughs> story. I mean, they always said, you know, the night the couple are out and he's done this nice thing, and let's go put it up the hill and bam. So, sloth and torpor. Fatigue is real. The average North American is two hours a night sleep deprived. We live in, in pretty extreme fatigue, and that's normal for us. So when you start meditating, you start running into your fatigue. And so one thing that makes more sense, makes sense is to get more sleep, but also to learn that falling, this, this, this dropping off into sleep is not not meditating, it's meditating on the process of disappearing. Do you suppose death is any different from just losing consciousness? Probably it's just the same thing. Who knows? I don't know. But, <laughs> but a good way to practice is, and you can, you can come to such ease with the, with the losing consciousness that it no longer is really painful. It becomes like going to sleep at night. We begin, we begin to trust it. So that's sloth and torpor. So far we've had desire, I want it, I want it. Aversion, I don't want it, I don't want it. Restlessness, agitation, ah, I want to figure it out. Ah, I have too much energy, and then there's sloth and torpor dullness, which is the opposite, falling asleep, losing consciousness. And then the fifth doesn't need a polar opposite. It's sufficient unto itself, and that's doubt. Self-doubt, doubt in the practice, doubt about life, doubt, despair, dispiritedness, depression. depression. Doubt is composed of conflicting belief systems. I know this works, I'm gonna meditate because it really works. Oh no, I don't think this works. I think I'd be better off. I think I should do a different practice. So I, maybe I... So, here I am, at one with everything, and then choo, wanting, wanting, disliking, disliking, restless, agitated, worried, sloth and torpor, falling apart, and doubt. I just remembered something, something quite fun, actually. Over here, under the arm of our friendly skeleton, may I? I'd like to introduce you. Hi, I'm Sloth. <laughs> I'm Tapir. <laughs> We're pals. <laughs> so, from there, Sloth and Tapir. The only way, the only way to become free from these powerful aspects of human consciousness and body is to wake up. To wake up and to bring tremendous love and compassion to ourselves around, this is who I am, or at least this is who I think I am. 
When I'm in desire, I think I'm desire. When I'm in aversion, I think I'm aversion. When I'm in sloth and torpor, sloth and tapir, I'm in, I think that's who I am. I, when I'm in restlessness, agitation, and worry, that's who I think I am. When I'm in doubt, doubt, doubt I like to call uh, the practice killer because when we fall into doubt, we stop practicing, we stop coming. That's one of the reasons it's so helpful to have a community of practice and at least a friend to practice with. Because doubt will come. Doubt is part of the dark night of the soul, and there may be a few of those in a lifetime. When when really bad stuff happens, one of the things that happens for us is we have um, we doubt our spiritual system. Our, 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 we, o we often will have to go through enough suffering in doubt to open up to a new level of faith, a new level of understanding of what the teaching is. <coughs> in a way, I think I'm, I'm not suffering much doubt, but I think I am awakening into a new level of realization of the utter impermanence of life. And it's, it's quite unsettling. Talking with my friend Larry yesterday, I, was, I have this easy, easily, it's close to tears often. Often around people connecting or people being with their children or something, I see that. And there's this upwelling that happens because it, it's all so apparently transient to me. It's like, it's, um, I have a grandson who's 15 months of whew, a holy terror, oh my God. <laughs> He, he, he doesn't walk anymore. He's, everything's a run, and a, a run and a crash. And, a, <laughs> and, and then a, 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 this cupboard is suddenly, we thought it was safe, and suddenly it's not. And, and I get to see him, and I see him for a little while, and then he's gone. And then I get to see him next week, maybe. Or, but there's, I have these momentary, almost like a tachistoscopic presentation. And it's true with every relationship. And somehow it's, it's, it's digging its way in that it's all like that. So the five hindrances. It really is important. I'd say, I guess I would say this as boldly as this. If you're not really fluent in the five hindrances, you can't really practice effectively. Because, because what that means is we'll go blind, we'll, we'll go, we'll go into blur and not know what to do. And we'll think that meditation means paying attention to the breath. The breath is the training wheels, really. Have you ever, I've, I've taught a couple of several kids how to use a bicycle and you put the training wheels on, but learning how to be a great breath meditator isn't, it's great, it's great for relaxation, it's great for lots of things, but it isn't realizing, oh, there's the five hindrances, and then fueling the five hindrances are all the emotions, from the greatest of joys to the greatest of sadnesses, and confusion and despair, and to not be able to witness them with equanimity, with ease, means to be shrunken down, to be contracted. And so when I always, on retreat, I always talk about the five hindrances on the first day. We start in the evening and then by afternoon on the first day, I figure people have suffered enough. I mean, not that it'll stop, but, but they should at least have the training wheels and the next set of training wheels. And so then I introduce the five hindrances with these instructions. If you're sitting and you can't find the breath because you're too out of it somehow, up-level the game at least one level and notice, so, which of the five hindrances are here? And you'll discover almost always, oh, I'm really caught up in desire or aversion or restlessness, agitation, worry, or sloth and torpor or doubt. Or there's some emotion that's, there's some emotion that I'd rather not know about. And I've said this here many times that um, 
it's very common, as I get to know people in their meditation practice, that, that people will come to see me and they say, well, you know, I had a really strong practice for until about two months ago, and then I stopped. And then I, uh, I ask the question, well, what happened three months ago or so when you stopped that increased the pain in your life? And they'll go, oh, well, my mother died, or I lost my job, or... And so then it becomes apparent that we stop meditating when the pain becomes more than we can face. And so sitting doesn't work anymore because we don't know how to sit with the pain. I, I, for a while there, my concentration was so good, I, could, I entered this sort of bliss state every time I meditated. And then, you know, my child had this accident there. And, uh, but the person then didn't realize, oh, all right. That bliss state is gone. What state is here? Wow, it's terror, or it's anger, or it's fear, or it's whatever, it's some combination. Or it's, it's a combination of the five hindrances. There can be aversion and restlessness and agitation, easily in doubt. There, as uh, Sylvia Borstein named them, they come as multiple hindrance attacks. <laughs> right? there's, there's desire, it's 12 o'clock high, and there's, so those are the five hindrances, and uh, I, I really recommend that you maybe look them up and uh, do a little reading about them, but more importantly, that you, you turn them into one of your regular touch points in your meditation. Why am I not, what, what is it that, in, into what am I contracting that results in me forgetting that I'm everybody. Into what am I contracting that I'm forgetting to be loving? Joanna Macy just pop, popped to mind something that she said years ago, it affected me very profoundly. She said, take time, really take time to do your own grieving, which is part of what happens in meditation. Do your own grieving and deal with the pain that's there when you stop, because otherwise when the going gets rough, you'll turn on your loved ones. And that's true, right? If we, if we really want to not, all this, there's so much acting out happening now. The, 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 the horrors of the right wing, fascist craziness, mental illness emerging from under the rocks and the Antifa equally crazy emerging from under their rocks and this, this stuff happening all over this oppositional, and um, that's in all of us. It's, it's we're all capable of that, given the right or the wrong conditioning. So, learning to be stable enough in ourselves to tolerate that in ourselves and to see it in the world, and then to move more and more toward loving. makes me think um, in the next week or so you will be receiving probably something through the internet from Tricia sitting here, Patricia, uh, asking about your interest in somehow or another finding a way for PIMC to support you and us in some quality of engagement with the, with the world. And we had a wonderful meeting, I thank you for it the other day. And I was, because it, uh, it helps, it helps to be doing something outer, as well as to be doing something inner. And so we're going to be, uh, be exploring that terrain a little bit as a community and as individuals, so thanks. Well, I wish there was time to say, let's have some questions and comments, but there isn't. So I'll be around for a while afterwards, and please come and talk to me if you wish. Uh, I will be absent next week, blessedly, 
Jennifer and I are going to our campsite that we love to go to <coughs> off uh, the Umpqua River. We're gonna have eight nights with no electronics and two dogs and the river. Lots of quiet. So thank you for listening. It's, uh, it is an extreme privilege for me to get to pass this on to you. I'm thankful to Ruth to Uba Ken and all the way back to the Buddha. And uh, I know that it's a lot to listen to this much. And I hope it, I hope it plugs into places in your heart and, and mind where it's really useful and where, where it can help um, bring greater peace to all of us. So let's make a big circle, please. going to be challenged blowing out the candle. <laughs> no one leaves till we blow out the candle. Well, thanks for joining us out there, dear friends on the on your television screens and computers. And for the for the angels in the attic up there. <laughs> So let's become aware of these hands. Goodness, my left hand, my hand has sparkly nails. <laughs> oh, cool. And let's give them a little squeeze. Give the one on the left a little squeeze, the one on the right. And then maybe poke around a bit with a finger and discover the great secret that there's a skeleton standing on your left. <laughs> pretending to be a human, padded, it's a padded skeleton. And there's another one on your right. How odd. <laughs> Becoming aware of our feet touching the floor. It's a real privilege to walk through these front doors participate in this community of awakening, to somehow or another be drawn by that energy from inside us that says, wake up. Really, it's time. It's time to become more loving. Lest I forget, I will be absent next Sunday. Gregory Maloof, a marvelous teacher, will be here teaching next Sunday. I'm not sure what topic he will speak of, but he's always really quite remarkable, beautiful teacher. So, let's sing our song. <clears throat> May all <laughs> beings be happy. May all beings be happy. May all beings be happy. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. May all beings in all directions, beings of all kinds, our brothers and sisters of the air, the earth, the waters, all of our friends, all our relations, May we all know happiness, the causes of happiness, and the causes of freedom. And now we have a challenge. <laughs> Usually, we have children to help us. Let's try it. Take a deep breath in. <laughs> huh. I think we're screwed. <laughs> You people at home, help us. Let's try it. <laughs> Breathing in. Huh. 
What are we going to do? <laughs> Should we do it? Oh, here we go. <laughs> well, wanna try from here? We can do it. circle we're not helping. <laughs> Do come and have some food and let's connect. <laughs> <laughs>